If you have your Bibles and want to turn to Nehemiah chapter 11, we're going to continue with this series, Christian Unity, and we're going to continue with the little mini-series within this series about leadership, and tonight we're going to be looking at junior leadership. So last week, if you weren't here, we looked at senior leadership. Some of the qualifications for a senior leader that we saw listed in Timothy and Titus, we looked at those, but we also looked at some other ones that we saw, like in First Peter, where it says to be examples to your flock, things like that. Tonight, like I said, junior leadership, it's going to be pretty similar because a lot of the qualifications for a junior leader are the same as for a senior leader. But there are a few little differences that we'll look at. So we'll we'll get to it. So in Nehemiah chapter 11, and we'll be going through chapter 12, verse 26. So we got quite a bit to read, so we'll go ahead and get started. It says, Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of ten remained in other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. These are the chiefs of the provinces who lived in Jerusalem. But in the towns of Judah, everyone lived on his, on his property in their town. Israel, the priests, the Levites, the temple servants, and the descendants of Solomon's servants. And in, and in Jerusalem lived certain of the sons of Judah and of the sons of Benjamin, of the sons of Judah, Athiah, the son of Uzziah, son of Zechariah, son of Amariah, son of Shephatiah, son of Mahalalel, the son of Perez, and the Maasiah, of son, the son of Baruch, son of Kalahuz, son of Haziah, son of Adiah, son of Jorib, son of Zechariah, son of Shilonite. All the sons of Perez who lived in Jerusalem were 468 valiant men. And these are the sons of Benjamin, Salu, the son of Meshulam, son of Joad, son of Pediah, son of Koaliah, son of Maasiah, son of Ithiel, son of Jesh- Jeshiah, and his brothers, men of valor, 928. Joel, the son of Zikri, was their overseer, and Judah, the son of Hasanua, was second over the city. Of the priests, Jediah, the son of jo- Joorib, Jachin, Sariah, the son of Hilkiah, son of Meshulam, son of Zadok, son of Merath, son of Ahitub, ruler of the house of God, and their brothers who did the work of the house, 822, and Adiah, the son of Jer- Jeroham, son of Pel- Pelala, son of Amzi, son of Zechariah, son of Pashur, son of Malkijah, and his brothers, heads of fathers' houses, 242. Amishai, son of Azrael, son of Azai, son of Meshulamoth, son of Emmer, and their brothers, mighty men of valor, 128. Their overseer was Zabdiel, the son of Hagadilam. And the Levites, Shemaiah, the son of Hashab, son of Azricam, son of Hashabiah, son of Bunny, son of Shabbathai, and Josabad of the chiefs, chiefs of the Levites, who were over the outside work of the house of God, and Mataniah, the son of Micah, son of Zabdi, son of Asaph, who was the leader of the praise, who gave thanks 
to Bakbukia, the second among his brothers, and Abdi, the son of Shemua, son of Galal, son of Jeduthun, all the Levites in the holy city were 284. The gatekeepers, Achab, Talman, and their brothers who kept watch at the gates were 172. And the rest of Israel and the priests and the Levites were in all the towns of Judah, every one in his inheritance. But the t- temple servants lived in Ophel, and Ziha and Gishpah were, were over the temple servants. The overseer of the Levites in Jerusalem was Uzi, the son of Bani, son of Hashabiah, son of Mataniah, son of Micah, of the sons of Asaph, the singers, over the work of the house of God. For there was a command from the king concerning them, and a fixed provision for the singers, as every day required. And Pathahiah, the son of Meshezabel, the son of Zerah, the son of Judah, was at the king's side in all the matters concerning the people. As for the villages with their fields, some of the people of Judah lived in Kiriath, Kiriath Abba, and its villages, and in Dibon, and its villages, and Jacob, Jacobzil, and its villages, and in Jeshua, and in Moladah, and Beth Pelet, and Hazar Shuel, in Beersheba, and its villages, in Ziklag, in Mechanoa and its villages, in in Ramon, in Zora, in Jarmuth, Zenoa, Adalam, and their villages, Lachish and its fields, and Azekah and its villages. So they encamped from Beersheba to the valley of Hinnom. The people of Benjamin also lived from Geba onward at Michmash, Asia, Bethel, and its villages, Anathoth, Nob, Ananiah, Hazor, Ramah, Gitam, Hadid, Zeboam, Nebalat, Lod, and Ono, the valley of craftsmen. And certain divisions of the Levites in Judah were assigned to Benjamin. These are the priests and the Levites who came up with Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua, Sariah, Jeremiah, Ezra, Amariah, Malak, Hattush, Shechaniah, Rehum, Merimoth, Edo, Genetho, Abijah, Midjaman, Maadiah, Bilgah, Shemaiah, Jehorib, Jediah, Salu, Amok, Hilkiah, Jedaiah, these were the chief of the priests and of their brothers in the days of Jeshua. And the Levites, Jeshua, Benui, Cadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and Mataniah, who with his brothers were in charge of the songs of thanksgiving, and back Bukiah and Uni and their brothers stood opposite them in the service. And Jeshua was the father of Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, the father of Eliashib, Eliashib, the father of Joida, Joida, the father of Jonathan, and Jonathan, the father of Jadua. And in the days of Jehoiakim were priests, heads of fathers' houses, of Sariah, Moriah, of Jeremiah, Hananiah, of Ezra, Meshalem, of Amariah, Jehonanan, of Maluchi, Jonathan, and Shabaniah, Joseph of Haram, Adna, and Marianoth, Helkiah of Edo, Zechariah of Genethon, Meshalem of Abijah, Zikri of Minimum, and Moadiah, Piltai of Bilgah, Shamua of Shemaiah, Jehonathan of Jehorub, Madani of Jediah, Uzi of Salah, Kala of Amak, Eber of Hilkiah, Hashabiah of Jediah, Nathaniel. In the days of Eliashib, Joab, Johanan, 
and Judah, the Levites, were recorded as heads of fathers' houses, so too were the priests in the reign of Darius the Persian. As for the sons of Levi, their heads of fathers' houses were written in the book of Chronicles until the days of Johanan the son of Eliashib, and the chiefs of the Levites, Hashabiah, Sherebiah, and, and Jeshua the son of Cadmiel, with their brothers who stood opposite of them, to praise and to give thanks according to the commandment of David, the man of God, watch by watch. Madaniah, Bakbukiah, Obadiah, Meshalem, Talmud, and Akab were gatekeepers standing guard at the storehouses of the gates. These were in the days of Joachim, the son of Jeshua, and Jazodek, in the days of Nehemiah, the governor, and of Ezra, the priest and the scribe. Whew, that's a lot of names. <laughs> I, I I tried my best. I know some of them I'm probably mispronouncing. But this, as you can tell, this is a lot of names. This is a lot of junior leadership that was just called out right here. And and I'm I'm saying called out not in the way like we would call out, but honored because they're Nehemiah is calling their name out in in the book. But we also see this is a massive undertaking, rebuilding a country. So the senior leadership couldn't handle everything. So they had to appoint junior leadership in certain areas. And we see, like in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 11, it says the rest of the people cast lots to see who would stay in Jerusalem, who were the junior leadership that would stay in Jerusalem. And the rest of the people spread out to the other villages, the other towns, to start rebuilding and, and doing all their stuff. So chapter 11, verses 3 through 24, are all the leadership that stayed in Jerusalem, all the junior leaders. Verses 25 through 36 names all the villages outside of Jerusalem and their territory. In chapter 12 is where it started naming the priests and the Levites, the Levites being the junior leadership of the temple. And where did I put that note? Um, I forget where I put that note now. It's somewhere in here. We'll get to it in a minute. But if you look, um, if memory serves me correctly, in Numbers, it actually spells out what the duties of a Levite were. And in a nutshell, it was to help the priest make the sacrifices, help them with all the other daily duties that they had to do in the temple. Um, so, compared, like I said, compared to a church, this is massive. This is a massive, massive scale. A normal church probably won't see this sort of leadership number-wise. Um, but a good example from the New Testament is in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint this duty. So we see in Acts, as the New Testament church is getting started, there's more than what the senior leadership could handle at the time. So they had to appoint junior leadership to help them with all these things. The junior leadership can be appointed to most anything. But it's it, it's things that need to be accomplished on a reoccurring basis. So if it's just a one-off sort of thing, like, okay, 
this just needs to be fixed one time. You may not necessarily need a full-blown junior leader to oversee that all the time. But if it's something reoccurring that's going to happen over and over and over, that may be time when a junior leader is needed. So something, for instance, with that would be like security in a church or worship leader or children's minister, things like that. But it's going to look different for every church because every church is going to have different programs, things like that. Now, in First Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, Paul lists the qualifications for a junior leader. It says, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for, on, for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Excuse me. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Very, very similar to what Paul had to say about senior leadership. Really, the only qualification missing is the ability to teach. That qualification was listed only in the senior leadership. Does that mean junior leadership can't possess that ability? No. If a junior leader can teach, that's even better, but they're not required to have that ability. And we see in Nehemiah, like we were talking just a second ago, junior leadership can be appointed to anything that needs to be taken care of on a reoccurring basis. But we saw gatekeepers listed. So today that would be like our security. Singers, some churches have choirs. So if we if we had a choir, it might include some of those. Temple servants, just general helpers around the temple. He listed village leaders. So today we might refer to that as like a mayor of a town or something like that. All of these people were confirmed through casting lots. So if you're not familiar, casting lots in the Old Testament, similar to rolling dice nowadays, it was an, something that you did that had a random outcome that you couldn't control. And whoever, per se, the dice rolled to, that's who God chose. So, random event. Um, they used all kinds of things as their quote-unquote dice back in these times. But all of these people cast lots to see who did God want in that position. In Acts 6, we see, as we read further on, we see that the 12 apostles laid hands on and prayed for the folks that they put in those positions. So we don't necessarily cast lots today, but we do, we should be praying over and confirming who God wants in those positions, in the leadership positions. In chapter 12, it named the Levites, but the Levites didn't cast lots for their positions. Levites, going back to the Old Testament, yep, here's that note, Numbers 8, verses 5 through 22, is where all the duties of a Levite are named. Levites, as well as priests, had to be descendants of Aaron and of the tribe of Levi. That was required by the law. So there, there was no casting lots, and you had to be able to prove your lineage before you could take on those duties. 
So again, in Acts chapter 6, in verses 5 and 6, some of those juniors leaders, it said Stephen was a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. It also named Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, and Parmenas. And like I said, these guys were confirmed by the 12 laying hands on them and praying and confirming that that's who God wanted to lead in those areas. We don't see just a whole lot of stories about junior leadership in the Bible. We see more stories about the senior leaders, and we're more familiar with those stories. But some of the good junior leaders are people like Timothy. In 1 Corinthians 16.10, Paul sends Timothy to Corinth. So Paul, in that particular time, was the senior leader sending the junior leader who he was training to take his place to Corinth to do a job for him, to do a task, complete something. Also, if we think, who delivered all of Paul's letters to the different churches? Sometimes they're named, sometimes they're not. But those are good examples of a junior leader. In Romans 16, Paul lists a whole bunch of people that he honors in that letter, all of which are junior leadership. History outside of the Bible. Another name that I'm going to try to pronounce right, Athenaeus of Alexandria. He lived from either 296 or 298 to 373. And it looks like nobody's really familiar with him. Um, he began his leading role as a deacon and an assistant to Bishop Alexander of Alexandria. What these two are most famous for are defending the Trinity and Christianity at the First Council of Nicaea in 325. That council was convened by the Roman Emperor Constantine, and it was Bishop Alexander and Athenaeus debating that... I forget who it was. Now I didn't write it down. Uh, but they were debating against the Arianism leaders. So... And Arianism, their belief is that Jesus was created and he's not God. But those two successfully debated that, and that's why we stand here talking about the Trinity today, because we weren't basically overridden by the Arian beliefs. But in 328, Athenaeus replaced Bishop Alexander when he died. Without his help, some say without his help, Bishop Alexander may not have successfully debated that. He may not have won that debate. Could go either way, depending on your view when you read through the, the story. Another notable junior leader is a man named Justice Jonas. He was a disciple of Martin Luther. And he helped Martin Luther translate the Bible into German. Still, very notable accomplishments. And you don't have to be a senior leader to make a difference. As we can see from these two examples right here, senior leaders or junior leaders can make a world of difference. So if we sum all this up, if we take everything we learned last week for senior leaders and we take what we've learned today for junior leadership, we sum it all up because we've, we've covered a lot. There's two main points that cover everything for all leadership. The first point is leadership is granted in levels. 
that's granted in levels. So there's four main levels. The third level is broken into two categories. So the first level is to learn how to lead yourself. And what I mean by that is it's the process of discovering, building, and stewarding your life in Christ for the establishment of God's will. So what choices are you making? Are your choices in line with the Bible? Are your choices in line with God's word and what the Holy Spirit's telling you? Are you architecting or designing your day-to-day activities, your life, to be obedient to all of that? And are your choices in a manner that has you constantly improving and growing? Once you've gotten that to where the Lord is satisfied, he opens up the next level, and that's to lead a family. And you will take those same principles that you learned and developed for yourself, and you apply them to your family now, and you teach them how to do all of those things. The next step would be leading in the church. And this is the one that's split into two. So to start leading in a church, you start as junior leadership, and you prove yourself. Then... Same principles, in effect. Now you've got other people at the church that are under your leadership. Once you've proven there, you can move to senior leadership. Each one of these levels comes with more responsibility, more stress, and a bigger burden. And you can think of it like an upside-down pyramid. So if I'm standing here learning how to lead myself and make the right choices, follow the Holy Spirit. I've got one little weight right here, the very tip of the pyramid. Once I get that down and get it to where I can hold it up, the next level's added on. Family. Once I get that down and I can hold that successfully, the next level, junior leadership in the church. Same thing. Get that down. I'm successful. Senior leadership at each level keeps adding more and more and more. Any little crack in me and the whole thing comes tumbling down. One little failure on my part now affects more than just me. It affects a whole lot of people. And the greater the leadership the more you will affect. Point number two, be an example. We covered this last week as well. And we can spend a lot of time looking at all the different qualifications, but the most impactful one is to be an example. In Hebrews 13, 7 It says, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. As a leader, can we say we're at a point in our walk with God that we want people to imitate our faith? Peter, in 1 Peter 5, verse 3b, so it's the second half of that verse, he says, be examples to the flock. So leadership in whatever role, whether it's family, junior leadership in the church, or senior leadership in the church, are role models. And those leaders set the standards. Paul was probably the most outspoken on this. And a few examples of him saying this, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Philippians 4, 9, he says, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. 
in Acts 20, 18, this was when he was on his way back to Jerusalem and meeting with the elders at Ephesus. He says, and when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. So he didn't hide anything from them. He let them see his whole life. He was an example to them. But leadership, again, no matter what level, you need to set the example for those that you lead, whether it's just your family, a junior leadership or a senior leadership position. And there's a very high standard placed on leadership. So the Bible says that teachers will be held to a higher standard based on what they teach. Leaders are held to a higher standard based on how they lead. So in Hebrews thirteen seventeen it says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those will have as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So those who lead will have to give an account for how they lead. Jesus says in Luke 6, verse 40, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. How you lead will set the bar for all of those who follow you. If you lead with high expectations to follow God, they will rise to meet the occasion. But if you set the bar low, they're going to only do what they have to do. Another point that leadership should embrace is that change is beautiful. The great leadership, all the great leaders that you read about in the Bible, they know that they're not perfect. But they continue to point everyone to Jesus. They continue to point everyone to God. And they constantly seek the best for the ones that they lead while they learn that change can be a good thing. Sometimes the best thing is change because without change, there can't be growth. And to quote that great theologian, Anthony Dinozo, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So if you're not seeing the fruits of the Spirit, whether that be in your own life, your family, your church, Change is what's needed. Change to get them back in line with what God says. Change to get yourself back in line. Everything begins and ends with the leadership. First Peter 2.2 2 says, Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. We don't stay infants forever. We grow up. We change. That growth is beautiful. I'm sure every parent can agree. Watching their kid grow up into an adult, leave the house, and start their own life is a beautiful thing. The same with our spiritual side. Watching someone receive Jesus as their Savior and then grow up in the word and mature and build their faith and all. It's a beautiful thing, but it can't be done if they're only ever given milk. If, they're, if nothing changes, there is no growth. Hebrews five thirteen and 14, For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So again, change is good. Change means 
you're growing in your faith. You're growing closer to the Lord. You're growing in your walk with him. And to go back to the example of a parent and a child, a parent wouldn't give an infant meat to eat, would give them milk or formula, something tailored to their state at that time. But as that child grows, you swap them from milk to solid food. At the same time, once they get to be about five years old and they're eating solid food, you wouldn't give them a King James version of the Bible. It's not quite on their level. It's way above their level. You would give them a more age-appropriate Bible. And as they read it, learned, and grew in the Spirit, you would upgrade their Bibles to a more age-appropriate as they grew. So leadership needs to be in tune with what their family or their flock needs. So if your family or your flock needs more preaching or teaching, you need to be aware of that so that you can help provide that if they need more time in worship, if they need more time in prayer, if they just need shepherding or guidance or counseling. Those are things that leadership needs to be aware of within their families and their churches so that they can provide those things. And now we get to Psalms 23. I'm sure everyone is familiar with Psalms 23. A lot of people will turn to this psalm as a source of comfort and a source of reassurance of how the Lord is going to take care of them. And it is very good for that. But it's also good as a roadmap for leadership at any level because everything it lists in here are things that the Lord does. And if we're trying to be like the Lord as a leader, these are things that we are going to want to do. So when we look at Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So in verse 1, leaders should provide everything that they can to their family or their flock so that there's no quote unquote want. There are things like we can't provide salvation. Only Jesus can provide that. But there shouldn't be anything that they're lacking that we can provide. So he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. These are things Jesus is leading us to these green pastures and still waters. He knows what we need before we know that we need it. So he makes sure that we get it. So leaders need to be in tune enough to know the physical needs and provide those as best as possible, food, water, shelter, clothing, whatever the case may be. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Spiritual needs. We need to be in tune enough to know the spiritual needs and provide as best as possible. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Protection. Protection, both physical and spiritual. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. More provision, more physical and spiritual provision, as well as protection. You're preparing a table in the presence of your enemies. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A 
A leader will give confidence that they will always be there for their family and their flock. Psalms 23, it is a very comforting psalm, but it also is a very good lesson in leadership. And I just want to conclude tonight with an interaction between Jesus and Peter. I think this interaction really reiterates everything that I've said. And this is in John 21, verses 15 through 17. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Jesus said it three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. Are you feeding the flock that Jesus instructed, whether that's your family or your church? Are you in tune with what you need, what your family needs, and what your church needs? And are you being the example that you should be? I'll close this in prayer. And if anyone would like to pray, um, we'll have some music playing, hopefully. And if you want to come up, you can come up. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, and we just thank you again, Lord, for this opportunity to, to gather in your name. And we thank you, Lord, for the message that you brought to us tonight. We thank you, Lord, for helping us all to have open hearts and open minds to what you wanted to tell us. And we ask, Lord, that you help us to recall these lessons as we need them when we, as we go through our life. And, Lord, as we leave here, we just ask that you be with all of us and watch over us and protect us on our way home, Lord, and just help us all to get home safe and help us all to stay safe during these storms. And, Lord, we just ask that you keep all the bad weather away from the church, all the rest of our church family who isn't here tonight, the county, and everyone that we love. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.